Hi, everybody. We're back with Aubrey Cavanaugh of No Kill Huntsville and Alan Rosenberg, a New Jersey animal observer. We're talking about managed intake of found animals. You know, have shelters gone too far? We actually have been seeing this through the uh, COVID-19 response of a lot of shelters where they're really trying to um, keep animals out of the shelter, which is something that we all agree is a good idea, but just how far do you go and what are the best practices actually doing that? Um, what Austin had, uh, Ellen Jefferson from Austin had stated that during that time when they were trying this during COVID, keeping animals out, they actually had a higher return to owner, RTO, um, for stray animals by uh, putting more responsibility on the public for that. Um, so I wanted to point that out because I think that's something, uh, it's a good data point, but uh, you know we'll talk more about that. And then in Colorado, um, where, where uh, I, I'm the president of No Kill Colorado, what we saw was that there is, um, it, during the, the, the first two months of COVID, we were actually finding shelters empty. Um, and we were essentially a no-kill state. We actually posted that for at least a short period of time. But what were the consequences of that? And where does it go from here? So uh, for managed intake of found animals, what do you think? Have the animal shelters gone too far, Aubrey? Um, I think that in some places they have. Um, we all believe in managed intake when it relates to owned animals. Even though there's a perception on behalf of the public that animal shelters are obligated to take owned animals, um, in the vast majority of shelters across America, certainly tax funded shelters, that's not the case at all. They do try to help people who have come up with problems, whether there was a death in the family or someone lost their housing to a fire or somebody lost a job or just some unforeseen life circumstance. Um, many progressive shelters do, do try to help um, owners if they feel like there is just absolutely no alternative um, but surrender. And of course, the elements of the no-kill equation provide a foundation to try to keep that surrender from happening. But what we're seeing now in many locations with the COVID-19 crisis is, um, while some shelters that were progressive have continued to engage with the public um, and are um, asking the public for help, there are other shelters that have completely shut themselves off. And let, let me give you an example. In Huntsville, Alabama, if someone finds an animal running at large, and this is what has happened over the last three months, if I find a dog running at large um, and I wanna help that animal because I'm a good Samaritan, I'm gonna contact the animal shelter and say, hey, I found this dog, it's not my dog, um, what do I do? They're going to encourage me, they're gonna say, well, is it possible for you to foster that animal? Um, because if you foster that animal, that will allow us time to try to find the owner. We're keeping the animal out of the shelter, which is a very stressful environment. And it's possible that the dog you found or animal you found is with pretty, lives pretty close by to where you, were, where you found it. Um, if I tell them yes, then they'll work it out for, to get images from me, information about where I found the dog so that the dog can be an intake in the shelter. And that way, if an owner is looking for the dog, we can help, help reunite the dog with the owner. If I say no, I can't because I don't even live in the area where I found the dog, then the answer is okay, bring the dog on down to the shelter. I'm okay with that. The issue that I have where I think that some shelters have gone too far is there are some shelters that are saying, if you find an animal running loose, we're not gonna take it at all. You have to foster it. Or, and we had an incident with Austin recently where there was video footage of someone who found a dog, they brought it to the shelter and you can clearly hear on camera a staff member saying, well, no, we can't take that animal, just turn it loose. Um, which mortified all of us, right? Including a, a number of people in Austin, admittedly. And Austin quickly said, hey, look, no, that's not our policy. But then another example, I mean, we've got the Front Street Animal Shelter in Sacramento, California, that over a period of years under the leadership of Gina Knapp was, was not quite no kill, but it was pretty progressive. I saw a post on Facebook last week that said that they were just now, after months of not taking animals found by people running loose, that they were just now taking found animals by appointment only. And I was just appalled. This is a tax-funded animal shelter. If, if I live in Sacramento and I find a dog, um, I've probably gone back to work, by the way. If I find a dog, what, you're going to make me make an appointment? And then what am I supposed to do with that animal in the meantime, right? Do I really want to take that animal home? Maybe that animal has a disease. Maybe the animal will not get along. Maybe I don't have a place to contain that animal. 
I could see having someone who found an animal show up at the shelter, wait in the parking lot, call and say, I'm here. Can someone come out and help me? Because of course we should all still be taking precautions because of the pandemic, right? But to say that you have to make an appointment, and apparently this was a step forward for Front Street that over a period of many months wasn't taking animals found by Good Samaritans at all. So I think that, um, again, we see progressive shelters, they've done some good things. The shelter's not so progressive, they have gone too far. What do you think, Alan? Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Aubrey. Um, you know, I think finder to foster is the way to go if there is concerns about capacity at the shelter. I think, you know, going back to David's original point, I think the Austin data at this point is a little um, light to fundamentally change our position on taking animals in. Um, there's some data quality issues with that in terms of sample size and methodology. So I would need to see more data, much higher quality data before fundamentally changing the system. But in regards to managed intake, I totally agree with you. Owner, any, you know, managed intake, as we always think about it, is in regards to owner surrenders. And even that has always been one of these tough areas where there had to be strong guardrails around the program. Meaning um, people, the wait, the appointment time that people had before bringing the animal into impoundment had to be short. It couldn't be an endless wait list. The shelter always had to be willing to take the animal in if the animal was in danger. Um, so even with the owner surrender program, on a, with strays, as Aubrey mentioned, you know, th this is, this, th the shelter has an, a fundamental obligation to take these animals. So I think if someone finds a stray or calls animal control, you know, the shelter can't just say you have to take the animal in unless it's, you know, we're at the ex you know, the height of a public health emergency and, you know, everyone's on lockdown. Um, but now with things are normalizing, you know, you can't put that on someone. The best you can do is ask them to hold the animal. And, you know, I, I think um, to, I think the shelter on the, on the, at the same time can't just not take the animal in. I think they have to physically impound the animal and then put the animal into the finder's home as a foster have all the records at the shelter, including photos, uh, uh, details on the description of the animal, location where the animal is, because there's two things going on here. Um, there's, an, uh, there's a question whether the finder is more likely to find the owner or the shelter if the animal's at the shelter. Um, I think for dogs, that question is, is definitely out there. I would agree on cats, probably not likely that, that the owner's gonna find them at the shelter. But, the other question is, um, if, if the uh, person is looking for their animal and they're actively looking for the animal, they're more likely to find the animal at a centralized location than some undisclosed home. So I think at a minimum, the shelter has to impound the animal and put it in a foster as a foster. And at the same time, the shelter will also have skin in the game because if the shelter is impounding the animal, what happens to that animal affects the shelter's statistics and they will have an incentive to work with the finder slash foster to find the existing owner or a new home for the animal. Actually, there you, you brought up something that I, I don't think we have time for, uh, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, if uh, managed intake uh, of strays, of, of, of actually uh, pushing more responsibility into the uh, public actually would have worked, what will that do statistically to numbers in the shelter? It'd be a really interesting question to look at. Maybe we can do that on another panel in the future. Um, but this was a great talk. I appreciate your opinions. I think um, I think I think the concerns are clear. I've always been a proponent of engaging the public on the other side. So I'm kind of torn in between these two because I would love, I always believe that if we reach out to the public, we get more uh, than we expect or regressive shelters would get more than they expect from the public. Progressive shelters, I think, are actually getting it. So it's, uh, it's an interesting subject, and I keep going back and forth on different things on this. But thank you for your time. This was a great conversation. And uh, maybe we can talk about the, how this will affect statistics in the future. Uh, that would be a really interesting conversation. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, David.